Greetings, it is I, Tantus Naravan Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. It is time to continue our discussion on Pathfinder role-playing game system. When we last left off, we were, of course, talking about the environments you're going to explore in the world, and I was talking about mountains, being up in a mountain. Let's talk about one of the major hazards you're going to encounter in a mountain before talking about traveling in the mountains, and moving on from there. So, major hazard. Avalanches. You can encounter an avalanche in many of the high mountain areas. Now, avalanches come in two forms. They can be ice and snow, in which lots of ice and snow can cause it to do it. And even lots of ice and snow can cause the other type of avalanche, which is rocks and dirt. It's a cause and effect sort of thing, that their presence can, especially with melting ice and snow, can cause the other avalanches. Now, if you're in an area of an avalanche, an avalanche is effectively a colossal creature. You can spot it up to 1d10 times 500 feet away with a DC 20 perception check. Now, if I fail to see it, when it gets about half of that distance, I automatically see it. I automatically know it's coming from me, but it's managed to close the distance pretty rapidly. Uh, <laughs> less time to react for me. Now, on the other hand, if you can hear an avalanche coming, a lot easier. It really is. Granted, you don't know where it's coming from, but you can hear it then. At 1d6 times 500 feet away, you can of course make a DC 15 perception check to hear an avalanche, to know that, oh, an avalanche is occurring. I should probably get somewhere safe. That's probably a good idea. Now there are two zones in an avalanche. There is the bury zone and the slide zone. The bury zone is the center of the mass that's kind of barreling towards you. The slide zone is where the junk being ejected from the center is sort of spreading out into. Now, if you're hit by the burial zone, or you're within that area, you will take 5d6 points of damage, reflex dc 15 for half, and regardless of whether you save or not, you're buried in junk. Things have covered you over. In the slide zone, it's only 3d6 points of damage. Again, reflex dc 15 for half. If I make my reflex save, I'm okay. If I fail it, I'm buried also. A buried character takes 1d6 points of non-lethal damage each minute they are under the material from the avalanche. After the point in time that they go unconscious, well then, then they have to make a dc 15 constitution check every minute or take 1d6 points of lethal damage until they are rescued or die. Whichever of these will occur first. You, it's really not possible to dig yourself out of an avalanche when you're buried in it. You're kind of just messed up and covered in dirt and stuff, so you need some help, unfortunately. Now the width of the area a avalanche is going to be affecting is about 1d6 times 100 feet. Now only about half of it is the actual burial zone. That's the center of it. The rest of it on the outside is the slide zone. So it has this like center burial zone within that 1d6 times 100 feet, and then it slide zones to either side. Now, if your character is in the way of an avalanche, you will roll 1d6 times 20, and that's effectively how close you are to the center of the avalanche. To figure out how you are in relation to it, it's the rule of thumb. Granted, your GM could also just kind of be a jerk and put you directly in the center of it, but that's a little more organic because you're probably not necessarily going to be in the path of the avalanche, especially if you are being put in the path of an avalanche. Now, a snow and ice-based avalanche travels at 500 feet per round. A rock and dirt one travels at 250 feet per round. That gives you an idea of how many rounds you have to actually try to get out of the way of the avalanche. Now, let's talk about traveling in the mountains, because this is not one that we actually have to talk about too. When you're in traveling the mountains, you have to worry about things like cold, the higher up you go, but also lack of oxygen. You need to be able to breathe. There's less oxygen the higher up you go in mountains. Now, if you're something that's acclimated to mountains, you don't have to worry about it. But you as a player could actually try to survive better there. You can acclimate to mountains too. You means you have to you avoid a lot of the bad effects of being up in the mountains, but it takes you quite a while. You have to live about a month within that area to finally acclimate to it. And if you're away from the mountains for more than two months, you lose that acclimation and you have to get it back again. This works for any mountain-based creature that might be existing there. So, yep, you can acclimate to mountains, but it will take you, again, one month, and <laughs> after two months you'll lose and have to try to get it back. 
Now there are three altitude zones when we're talking about mountain. First there's low pass. That's actually anything under 5,000 feet elevation. This is just al alpine meadows, things of that nature. It's, it's nothing wrong with it. You don't have to worry about this. Low pass, you're fine. Next one comes up though, and this is where it starts to get difficult. High pass slash low peak. This you are from 5,000 to 15,000 feet up. This, you have to start worrying about the acclimbing. You have to start worrying about your oxygen. May I note, I'm not going to be talking about cold at all here because it's just like being in an Arctic area. Cold is cold. Now, for each hour, you're in these high, higher peak area or low peak slash high pass areas. You have to make a fortitude save DC 15 plus one for every previous check you've made. As soon as you fail one, you get fatigued. And you don't lose that fatigue as long as you are in the mountains. The only exception is those that are acclimated, acclimated do not need to make checks and could recover from this fatigue. So effectively, more than likely, if you're spending a month there, you're going to be fatigued for the entire month <laughs> or most of it because you're going to fail one. If you're spending a short time period there, maybe you can stave off that fatigue. Maybe you can't. That's going to be the difference because it's going to keep getting up that DC higher until you actually fail it. Now, the real problem comes when you go to high peaks, anything over 15,000 feet. This, this is where the danger comes in. You still have the pro previous problem of the one below there worrying about becoming fatigued, but at this, this point you can get altitude sickness. That's the difference that's being added in. And again, I'm not talking about cold because it's probably going to be really freezing up there. Altitude sickness affects everyone. It includes things that are acclimated to the mountains. So that's a big important thing I have to mention. If you're acclimated to the mountains, you still have to worry about this one. For every six hours you're at an elevation that this high, you have to make a fortitude save DC 15 plus one for every previous save you've made. If you make it, you're okay. If you fail, you take one damage to all of your ability scores. All of them. That's the problem that you get with facing at this high level. Now you do get an advantage if you're acclimated. You get plus four to this check. So you get a bonus for being acclimated to high altitudes but it's not gonna prevent you from getting affected by it and probably be getting ravaged by it. Altitude sickness sucks. Let's move on from mountains though and start introducing you to, of course, deserts. Deserts are area known for having little rain, little liquid water, oftentimes having very massive temperature shifts, usually being hot, not necessarily. So there are three categories of deserts. There's tundra, which is the cold desert. There's rocky, which tend to be temperate deserts, but not necessarily, and then sandy deserts, which are the very warm ones. Now, the big exception here is tundra. The tundra can, at different times of the year, get covered in snow and ice. This means water will be there. It just means it's going to be frozen water, and precipitation isn't going to be arriving very much anyway. Granted, then, during certain points in the summer, the it actually can all melt then, and the permafrost will melt down to about a foot. This means effectively it will become this kind of muddy mess, which you will treat as shallow bogs from the marshlands. So tundra actually have some unique traits to them that's different than the other desert areas. Now, just as before, each one has features that there's percentile of. There can be undergrowth, like we talked about in previous ones. This is oftentimes kind of scrubby, hardy bushes or cacti, depending on the environment you're in. You can, of course, have ice sheets. Ice sheets can occur, especially in tundra. Well, they cost you two squares of movement to move through one square of it. It increases the DC of any acrobatics check by five. And if you want to run or charge, you have to make a DC 10 acrobatics check to do so. There can be light rubble. Light rubble is just like rocks and kind of ground cover that don't do a lot, but can mess around with you. It doesn't do a huge amount. It increases acrobatics DCs by two. So that's it for today. I finished talking about mountains by describing the avalanche, a major hazard there that you're going to have to worry about, before moving on and talking about the general traveling in the mountains with worrying about high altitude and lack of oxygen, and the two effects that they can have on you. Just the normal altitude attunement that you might have to get, and you might have to suffer if you don't have. And of course, altitude sickness, which is a terrible thing that you might suffer from also. 
before I moved on and started talking about the desert, talking about the three types of desert, and I began describing the features of it. In the next episode, I'm of course going to finish up talking about the rest of the features you can find within a desert, before moving on and talking about the plains terrain and talking about aquatic trains, being underwater. So if you have any questions, comments, anything you want to say, anything you think I left out, please just leave in the comments below. Please like, share, and of course, subscribe. It always shows your support for the channel, the Empire, and the work I do. If you want to show some extra support, you could always check out my Patreon, link in the description below. But regardless, until the next time, I bid you farewell.